There are design mistakes that I see made over and over again on the development of new electronic hardware products. So in this video, you're going to discover 10 of the more common design mistakes that I see. And this includes both specific technical mistakes and also more general mistakes. So there really is something here for everyone, regardless of your technical level. Hi, I'm John Teal, founder of Predictable Designs. Okay, let's get started. So the first design mistake that I want to discuss is failing to design for manufacturing. People always tend to underestimate the complexity of developing a new physical product, and they even underestimate more the complexity of actually manufacturing it. For many products, it takes nearly as much time and sometimes even more to get manufacturing set up and running as it does to actually develop the product. Manufacturing setup can also cost as much or more than all of your development costs. So it's really essential that manufacturability be a primary consideration during the entire product design process. And this process is called design for manufacturing or design for manufacturability or DFM for short. Nothing will slow down your path to market more than designing a product that you find out can't actually be efficiently manufactured. The old way of thinking was that engineers would develop a product and then they would just pass it on to manufacturing and manufacturing would have to actually figure out how to actually produce the thing. And there was really no interaction between engineering and manufacturing. But that's a horrible way to develop products, which is why all successful companies have now abandoned this old process. It's much better to develop a product with manufacturing in mind from the very beginning. But also don't forget about something known as design for testability, which is all about designing your product so that it can be easily tested during production. And this can be kind of considered a subset of design for manufacturability. The next design mistake that I want to discuss is the incorrect design of wireless circuits. If your product has any wireless functionality, then the PCB layout for any RF portions is going to be super critical. Unfortunately, it's done wrong more often than it is done right. So be sure you watch this one very carefully. So the maximum power transfer between a transceiver, so let, this could be Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, something like that. For the maximum power transfer between that transceiver and the antenna, their impedance must be matched. This means two things, two things are required. First is a proper transmission line connect, connecting the antenna to the transceiver. This transmission line is fabricated on the PCB specifically for carrying microwaves, which are just high frequency radio waves. In most cases, the transmission line is gonna to need to be designed with a 50 ohm impedance for maximum power transfer with the antenna. Be sure that you understand that it's not the resistance of the feed line. It's the impedance, the complex impedance it has between the feed line and the ground plane that's underneath of it. In addition to using a 50 ohm transmission line, it is also necessary to usually add some type of LC matching circuit. So an LC is just a, a simple circuit that consists of an inductor and a capacitor. So this circuit allows you to fine tune the impedance so you can uh, get it exactly right and you can optimize the, the matching, the impedance matching between the antenna and the transceiver so you get the maximum power transfer. If this matching is not done precisely, then you'll end up losing power along your feed line and what this will do is reduce the, the operating range for your, your wireless functionality. So it's, it's definitely something that you wanna pay close attention to. The next design mistake that I want to discuss, and this one is more general and less, uh, it's not a specific technical mistake like the previous one that we looked at. And this mistake is waiting too long to estimate the manufacturing cost for your product. Successful tech companies always know approximately how much a product is going to cost to manufacture well before they actually begin developing it. Otherwise, how can they know the product is actually worth developing? If you're not a billion dollar tech company, the odds are that you will first get your product fully designed, and then once you have that final prototype and you're ready to start manufacturing, then you will finally estimate how much the product is gonna to cost to manufacture. But what happens though if you discover that your product is going to cost more to manufacture than you expected? You could increase your sales price target, but that obviously has negative consequences. 
You could also make some redesigns to lower the manufacturing cost, but wouldn't it have been made more sense to just design it right the first time? For understandable reasons, many people think that you have to fully develop a product before you can accurately calculate the manufacturing cost, and that is absolutely untrue. With the right experience, it is possible to accurately estimate the manufacturing cost for just about any product. And this can happen well before any PCB layout or 3D modeling occurs. The next design mistake that I want to discuss is insufficient width for high current PCB traces. If a PCB trace will have more than roughly about 500 milliamps of current flowing through it, then in most cases, the minimum width allowed for a trace probably won't be sufficient. The required width of a PCB trace depends on several things, including the thickness of the trace, which is also uh, specified as the copper weight, and whether the trace is on an internal or an external layer. So if you have a, a four layer printed circuit board, there's two outer layers or two external layers and then two internal layers. And that makes a difference on how much current it can carry. For the same thickness, an external layer can carry more current for the same width than an internal trace because external traces have better airflow, allowing them to better dissipate the heat. The thickness depends on how much copper is being used for that conducting layer. Most PCB manufacturers allow you to choose from various copper weights from about 0 0.5 ounces per square foot. So that, that's typically the unit is it's in ounces per square foot. So anywhere from about a half an ounce per square foot up to about two and a half ounces per square foot. If preferred, you can convert the copper weight to a thickness measurement such as mills. And typically when designing print circuit boards, you're thinking in terms of mills. And if you don't know, a mill is just a thousandth of an inch. When calculating the current carrying capability of a PCB trace, you must specify the permissible temperature rise for that trace. Now I want to look at a more general design mistake that I see repeated over and over, and that is not getting an independent design review done. If you don't get an independent design review of your product before you prototype it, then you may literally be throwing money away. It doesn't matter how good of an engineer you may be or how good the engineer is that you've outsourced your product design to. No one is perfect and all engineers make mistakes. Shocking. I, I know. I can't believe that we make mistakes, but we do. So getting custom prototypes made, whether we're talking the PCB or the product's enclosure, isn't generally cheap. And the more prototype iterations that you require, the more it will cost in total. It will also take longer to develop and bring the product to market. One of the best ways to reduce the number of prototype iterations required is to get a second opinion called a design review. Successful tech companies always require their engineers to hold design reviews to seek feedback from as many other engineers as possible. Now we're going to look at another design mistake. It's a specific technical design mistake that I see made commonly on printed circuit board designs. And that is the incorrect use of decoupling capacitors. Critical components need a clean, stable voltage source to operate properly. And decoupling capacitors are placed on the power supply rail to help in this regard. However, for the decoupling capacitors to work their best, they must be placed as close as possible to the pin that's requiring the stable voltage. Also, it's critical to place the output capacitor for the power supply regulator as close as possible to the output pin of the regulator. For the next design mistake that we're going to look at, we're going to jump back to the product enclosure. And this mistake is designing the enclosure for your product so that it's not actually manufacturable. 3D printing is extremely forgiving, and you can really design and print just about anything your mind imagines. But 3D printing is only for producing a few prototypes. It's not for production. High pressure injection molding is the technology used for producing plastic parts in high volume. Unfortunately, injection molding is not at all forgiving. It is a technology with, that requires a lot of design rules that must be closely followed. These rules can be so major and so limiting as to require a major redesign 
just to make sure that it, your enclosure is actually manufacturable. When designing your product's enclosure, be sure to consider injection molding requirements from the very beginning. The next common design mistake that I'm going to look at is incorrect PCB landing patterns. All PCB design software tools include libraries of components that are commonly used. These libraries include both the schematic symbol as well as the PCB landing pattern. All is usually good as long as you stick with using the components in the, these libraries, assuming that they're correct. But from, in most cases, problems begin when you have to use components that are not included in these libraries. This means the engineer has to manually draw the schematic symbol and the PCB landing pattern. It's really quite easy to make mistakes when drawing a landing pattern. For example, if you get the pin-to-pin -pin spacing off by just a fraction of a millimeter, then it will make it impossible to solder the parts on the board because all the pins won't line up with the actual part. There's a really handy trick to, to, to help prevent this, and that is to print out your PCB layout on a, at a one-to-one -one scale so that it's exact same scale as the, the, the final printed circuit board. Then order samples of all the various components, mainly the microchips and the connectors, the more critical components, and then manually place those parts on your printed out PCB, P, PCB layout. This allows you to very quickly verify that all the landing patterns are correct and match the actual part. The next design mistake that I want to discuss, we're going to jump back to the PCB design again. And this mistake is actually designed into print a circuit board that either can't be manufactured or is just exceptionally expensive to manufacture. And these mistakes will commonly center around the types of vias used. So a, a via is just a, a conducting hole in a PCB that connects signals from different layers. So if you have a, a, a signal on layer one and you want to continue routing it on layer four, then you would just via have a, a via, which is a, a hole with the conducting material in it so that the electrical signal can uh, go from layer one down to layer four. And the most common type of via is known as a through via. And the name through via comes from the fact that it goes through all the layers of the board. Here you, in this image, you can see a cross-sectional view that shows three types of PCB vias. This one here that's labeled number one is a through via. This means that even if you only want to connect a trace from say layer one to layer two, if you're using a through via, then all the layers will also have this via. This can act to increase the size of a board since the vias reduce the routing space on layers not even using the via itself. There are two solutions to this problem. If, if reducing the size of your board is of utmost importance, then you can look at two uh, types of vias called a blind via, which is like here you can see uh, shown that's marked number two in this image where it connects uh, layer one to layer two. Then the other type of via is a buried via, which is shown as number three here, and a buried via actually connects two internal layers. The problem with blind and buried vias is they have very strict limitations on which layers they can be used to connect. And it's all too easy to use a blind or buried via in a way that can't actually be manufactured or prototyped. Be warned though that even if you use blind and buried vias correctly, they will drastically increase the cost of your prototype boards. Many times their use will in fact double the cost of your prototype boards. But keep in mind this, this board increase will become a lot less significant once you're, you're producing high volume mass produced boards, but it's, it's mainly gonna be a financial obstacle when it comes to the, the cost to prototype your board. In almost all cases, it's, it's really best to completely avoid the use of buried and blind vias unless you absolutely must squeeze every square millimeter out of that board. Uh, typically, they're, they're not worth the additional cost uh, for what little bit of space uh, savings that they're gonna offer. Okay, finally, the number 10 most common design mistake that I see is incorrect PCB layout of switching regulators. So a switching regulator converts one supply voltage to another by temporarily storing energy and then releasing it in the, to the output in a controlled fashion. The storage elements used are inductors and capacitors for switching regulators. Compared to a simple linear regulator, switching regulators are extremely efficient and waste very little power. 
However, they are much more complicated to use correctly. One of the biggest complexities of using switching regulators is correctly designing their PCB layout. You can't just randomly lay down the components and connect them up with a switching regulator. There are very strict layout rules that you need to follow for laying out a switching regulator correctly. Fortunately, nearly all data sheets for switching regulators will include a section in the data sheet that will show you the proper way to do the layout and will typically give you an example of how to do the layout correctly. Hopefully this video has helped you eliminate at least some of the more common design mistakes that I see made. If you have found it helpful, please give me a, a like or a comment below. I would really appreciate it. I'm John Teal with Predictable Designs. I hope you found this video helpful and I hope you have a great day. Hey there, this is John Teal, founder of Predictable Designs. If you enjoyed this video and you want to keep learning more about developing, manufacturing, and selling new hardware products, then be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also check out the websites predictabledesigns.com and thehardwareacademy.com.